Ooh, it's me, Julian Greystoke. I'm wearing my Salt Maid shirt. Because we're about to get kind of salty up in here. Today we're going to talk about a book that hurt me uh, because I was really excited. Uh, the direction it was going, it seemed like it was going to be a new favorite, and then it just took a nosedive. It just it disappointed me so badly. So we're going to talk about White Stag, or the white stag? I can't remember, it'll be on the screen. Okay, since I seem to have forgotten to do my synopsis portion of this video, I'm going to read off of Goodreads. The last child in a family of daughters, 17-year-old Janeki, was raised to be their male heir. While her sisters were becoming wives and mothers, she was taught to hunt, track, and fight. On the day her village was burned to the ground, Jineki, as the only survivor, was taken captive by the malicious Lydian and eventually sent to work for his nephew, Soren. Jineki's survival in the court of the merciless monsters has come at the cost of her connection to the human world. And when the Goblin King's death ignites an ancient hunt for the next king, Soren senses an opportunity for her to finally, fully accept the ways of the brutal permafrost. But every action he takes to bring her deeper into his world only shows him that a little humanity isn't bad, especially when it comes to those you care about. Through every battle they survive, Janeki's loyalty to Soren deepens. After dangerous truths are revealed, Janeki must choose between holding on or letting go of her last connections to the world she no longer belongs to. She must make the right choice to save the only thing keeping both worlds from crumbling. My notes might be a bit random, I have a lot of them, so strap in, kids. The book begins with a little note from the author who talks about how this is kind of her therapy book. Some people have written those where you write a book that really just kind of helps you struggle through things that you're dealing with. And so that is what this was for this author initially. There's always this fear that if you criticize a book like this that you'll be criticizing this author's journey or their mental health or that kind of thing. And that's definitely not where I'm intending to come from because in the end, a book that you publish is meant to be read by other people. And so you are going to have to make it a lot less personal and I don't think this book did a great job with that. But let's just get started. The reason I got really excited and thought this was going to be my new favorite fantasy book was the first chapter was such a hook. Wow. It just went straight in to this situation that the main character is in with like this excellent blend of showing us about the world, showing us who the main character is, showing us what she has to deal with, introducing some key characters. Like, hot damn. If, if the rest of this book can follow that, I am so on board. Step aside other fantasy books. This might be the one not only that is a new favorite, but also gets me out of my fantasy reading slump. And then it let me down so hard. Now you're probably thinking, goblins. But in fact, we are talking goblins. We are dealing with sexy goblins here, and really they could be interchangeable with any type of fae. Many reviewers have pointed this out. Why are they goblins? They don't need to be goblins. They could be fairies or fae or elves or really any sexy, ethereal, long-lived being. But in this, they are goblins. Dance, magic, dance. She has been a thrall to these goblins for many, many years, like a hundred years or even more than a hundred years. She has been in the Goblin Kingdom where she does not age. She is a slave. She used to be a slave for this one very, very evil goblin who did horrible things to her, but now she works for a different goblin who seems to be kind and good. But the Goblin King has just died and that means that the fight for the throne is on. And to do that, they have to kill this white stag and whoever kills the white stag in this great hunt will be the next Goblin King. That sounds pretty enticing, doesn't it? Uh, so let's talk about how this book squanders it and falls flat on its face. First of all, the goblins. I really wish I had a stronger idea of who or what the goblins are. Like, we're told that they're very inhuman, except when they're not. They don't understand emotions or humor or sarcasm, except when they do. It's really random, and the goblins and their 
species just is not well fleshed out or thought out. We're just told one thing and then something else is demonstrated later and it's very annoying and frustrating. And I don't think it's because the author was trying to necessarily do anything with it. It's just that I think she liked the idea of these goblins being very inhuman, but she also didn't really know how to write super inhuman characters. How can you have delightful banter with your love interest if he doesn't understand humor? A lot of this is going to be problems with the world building because the world building in this book was real, real bad, y'all. And one of the things was that everyone has power, which is a life force or maybe just the force or something, but everyone has, everyone and every creature has power within it. And when you kill someone else, you steal their power magic, whatever. It's really not explained, uh, but it's there. It sure is there. It's really not explained is like the key phrase for this book. At first I was intrigued by the relationship that the main character has with her current goblin master because it was doing pretty well. He clearly fancies her, but she is, at least initially, not interested because she is his slave. And he's like, oh, we're friends. And she's like, are we though? Are we though? Or am I just behaving like your friend because I am literally your slave and I have to? You know, and I liked that dynamic. Unfortunately, as we're going to talk about, that was kind of... Um, gone after a while and uh, yeah. The main character is also becoming more goblin as she lives in their world, commits more murders to survive in their world, absorbs more power. She's becoming more and more goblin and she could become a changeling which means that she's a human who transformed into a goblin and she does not want to do this. One of the themes, I'm going to be making so many quotes, the themes of this book is becoming a monster and whether that's bad, but it's really poorly explored. Clumsy. Everything in this book is so clumsy, except that first chapter. I was interested in the human world that, that the main character came from, but again, we don't get a lot of world building about that either, except that um, they are apparently based sort of on... Norse peoples and they follow Odin and that kind of thing very tangentially like loosely like maybe you can get some of that lore in there I guess uh, her father was a lord or an arl or whatever they are I forget but he had only daughters and so our main character was his last born child who turned out to be also a girl so he was going to raise her as a boy so that she could take his place uh, and that's a cool concept that never goes anywhere. I shouldn't say never goes anywhere. The character does occasionally, when she remembers to, struggle with the fact that she was raised as a boy when she wanted to be a girl, she wanted to be feminine, she wanted to do womanly things, and instead she was raised to do masculine things. Every now and then that comes up. Why? Uh, I don't know. Maybe a little bit in the end she gets people to call her by her feminine name and like that's I guess exciting but it's it's clumsy. After that first exciting moment then we get very slow and very telly and it's just what is this character thinking over and over again and it reminded me a lot of um, Zenith where there's a lot of being in the characters heads and them thinking and remembering and that sort of thing and it's just not enticing to read. There's a female goblin called Elvira and I cannot picture anything else but this so thanks book. Every time Elvira was mentioned, that's what I pictured. Is that what you wanted? Because that's what happened. I'm very confused again by the goblins. They cannot create, which is why they enslave humans. Humans create things for them, but they go but the goblins can decorate. So like, I just, I don't understand the rules and I don't think the author did either. I think she just made up rules whenever she needed them and then proceeded to ignore those rules later down the line. Most of these characters are huge cliches. The bad guy is just evil and nothing else. Just the most despicable goblin that could ever be. And there's a childlike character who is every childlike happy character who we're supposed to like. She's the Rue of this book, if you will, except for Rue is better written. And there's a comic relief character who's just sassy, sometimes for no reason. Everybody is just a cliche. And the, the love interest is like this sort of 
heartthrobby, super sexy anime boy type. Also, again, I don't understand goblins because apparently they have loving families because the little goblin girl like talks about how she was raised by her father and how well he treated her and I'm like, do goblins have loving families? Because I felt like they didn't, but I guess maybe they do? What is going on? Are they like humans or are they not like humans? And in what ways? There's a little bit of that creepy Sorin, her goblin master, has loved her since she was a baby. It's not quite romantic love, but he's like kept an eye on her and wanted her to get into the goblin world since she was a baby and I don't love it. The magical powers that the goblins have are so random and convenient. The author will literally just make up a new power when they need one, like, oh, somebody's injured, suddenly the goblin can heal people. Oh, we have this problem. Oh, the goblin can solve it with magic. Which is whatever they need at any given time, they can suddenly do apropos of nothing. Something that I really, really didn't like is I was really hoping that we would get a separate love in interest from the main character's goblin master, but no, he is the love interest. So she falls in love with her slave owner because he's the only one who treats her nice. But he still owns her. He owns her! <laughs> if you're into slave master, like, romance, maybe this will be up your street, but I hate it. I hate it. Even though he treats her nice and he treats her as though she has free will or whatever, he owns her and, as I will mention later, he does not set her free for a really, really long time into the book, long after she has given in to his constant, like, pining after her and I hate it. Clearly, clearly, the author of this book is a fan of Labyrinth. The main character even says to the bad guy at one point, you have no power over me. You have no power over me. So we are definitely dealing with a David Bowie-inspired goblin situation. This author has a lot of writerly tics that young authors often have. I think this might be her debut, and so hopefully she will start to get rid of these. But there is a lot of filtering. There is a lot of my heart pounded in my chest. Well, you don't need in my chest. Where else would your heart be? While the comic relief character is a cliche, when he did show up, I was actually pretty happy to see him because before that, it's just our two leads, our two romantic leads and boy are they dour and angsty and I just getting sick of their shit. Our main character has a lot of soul pain and a lot of that pain is from her old master who brutally raped her and so if you are sensitive to that probably don't read this and also he mutilated one of her breasts so badly that it had to be removed so she only has one breast and I just don't know why. I don't really understand why the one breast thing is a thing unless it's something to do with the author herself, and I try not to speculate about that. It's not important. Like, she's not even self-conscious about it. She's just like, oh, you know, my chest is really scarred up and I'm missing a boob, but she, she doesn't even really seem to mind too much. So, like, what, why is it? Why? Again, I say the world building relies heavily on, we need this to exist in the story now. So it exists. There's a lot of hurt comfort in this, like, it, it reads like a fanfic at times because the main character is constantly injured and her love interest has to be always healing her and comforting her and dealing with her soul pain and then he gets injured and she has to do the same for him and it's just like all this one big like pile of hurt comfort. If you are into hurt comfort fanfic, you might like this though. I am though, I'm actually quite into hurt comfort fic and I didn't like this so I don't think it's done the best. You have to space it out. You can't constantly have characters being miserable through an entire book or it's just too much. After a while, the story begins to read like a video game. You talk slash bargain with some magical being who gives you a quest. You go on that quest, you succeed. Magical being gives you something or you succeed and something else happens. It's just very... The, repeat that for most of the middle of the book. There is the healing sex trope. If you're not a fan of that, maybe avoid this, where she finally does have sex with her handsome goblin man, and uh, because he is the nice one, there's no trauma related to it. She doesn't start to panic or anything. 
because it's the good special Healy sex. Again, I have this again because it really bothered me. The goblin hottie owns the main character as a slave, pursues her romantically even when she says no, and we're supposed to root for their love. No, thank you. Thank you, no. I will pass. That's a no for me. Supposedly, the main plot of this story is to hunt the stag, but the whole stag hunting thing is very confusing. For a long time, we almost forget about the stag, and then it finally comes back and it's like, oh, we don't have to hunt it after all because it'll randomly appear when two great, like, champions start fighting each other. So, like, why were we hunting it? Why couldn't we just start fighting each other? I'm so confused by this stag, and then they kill it, but they have to kill it on uh, within the goblin realm or something, but it's like half in and half out, and therefore bad things. It's so confusing. The world building is shite. Finally, at the very end of the book, the goblin frees our main character from being his slave. Finally, but it's framed as a bad thing because she is being separated from him right when he's about to go into a dangerous situation and he frees her literally so she won't have to come with him. And, and we're supposed to be sad that he set her free. She was his slave! Why didn't he set her free right away? Why wasn't he like, oh I can see that you're miserable and that's why you're not in love with me so why don't I free you? I don't care if he treated her nice. He owned her. Someone rides a Mustang. Mustangs are not native to any Nordic places to my knowledge, so I don't know where this is taking place, but who cares at this point. The language in this book is all over the place. Sometimes it'll sound very fantasy-y and fairy tale -y, and then all of a sudden characters will say some really modern phrase that comes the fuck out of nowhere, and it, it's really distracting. I wish this had been better edited for that kind of thing. And finally, I'm just going to spoil the ending because I kind of do recommend that you just give this book a miss, personally, but if you don't want the ending spoiled, I'm gonna put River Song there, and then when she goes away, you can come back. We still have things to talk about, it won't just be the outro. So, uh, at the end, the main character, like, finds the stag dying half in and half out of both worlds, and she, like, flops over it, and then she goes into this, she also dies and goes into this other world, and she gets to become the stag, but like a hot lady version of the stag, and she gets to be with her handsome goblin man, except for now she's like a hot ethereal being to go with his hot ethereal being, and it's just like, what? What just happened and why? None of this. Like, the ending of a book should be a culmination of the things that happen within it. Not some completely random confusing thing that just comes the fuck out of nowhere. But I guess completely random confusing things that come the fuck out of nowhere are basically this entire book, so I don't know. I don't know, but I hate it. Okay, you can come back. The last thing I wanted to talk about is the self-insert nature of this book. Because it was this author's therapy book, which she, just, she does just straight up tell us at the beginning, the main character is completely her. And so the main character has been through bad things, but now the wish fulfillment comes in when the main character is super competent, is super strong, and all of her, all of the good guys exist to love her unconditionally, tell her how awesome she is at all intervals, basically worship at her feet. So this is a very self-insert wish fulfillment book. And knowing that you can see it even more strongly and I think that's where it really fumbles because when you put yourself into a book you're not always as careful to not only flesh out the character but if it's a wish fulfillment book you have to be really really careful that you keep enough conflict for the main character. The conflict cannot all be in their past. They have to have something new to face and they, this doesn't really, like, she has the rapist goblin as the main bad guy, but, like, she doesn't even really face him in the end. Her lover does, and her lover is just perfect in every way. Even when they fight, he immediately comes crawling back, he immediately forgives her. He's just the most precious anime boy there ever was. And so, I think that's where this book really falls apart, is that... Yes, write this book for therapy, 100%. Write this book for yourself. But if you are going to publish it, you're going to have to find a way to go back into it with a very critical eye and try to find those places where you have put too much of yourself 
into the book. And I don't mean putting yourself in the book like I put my heart and soul into this book. I mean literally you have put a character who is you on the page and given her all of these amazing things. Wow, those were all of my very salty thoughts about the White Stag. And again, I think it hurt me even more because it started out so strong that I was certain I was going to be in love with it. And then it just face-planted super hard onto the pavement. So if you're a fantasy fan, I'm gonna recommend that you give this one a miss. But if I said anything that sounds enticing to you, like you like this master-slave relationship, you're, you don't care if the plot is really not there, and you like Hurt Comfort fanfic, maybe if all of those things are things you like, maybe you'll like this book. But I can't say that I did. <laughs> Have you been reading any good fantasy books lately? I've been in a real fantasy slump lately, and I, I just really need to find something that gets me back in a fantasy, because I love fantasy. Don't forget, everyone, that I post new videos Mondays and Fridays. All the links to my doobly... All the, link, all the links to my social media are in the doobly-doo for ease of your clicking. If you liked what you saw here, I have a ton of content already on this channel, so please feel free to roam about and check all of it out. It's all in playlists and everything's super easy. If you want to support me monetarily, you can help me out by going over to my Patreon, where for as little as a dollar a month you get exclusive content not seen here on the regular channel. And I will see you again next Next time with whatever it is I happen to be doing next time. Bye! Well, it's that time again. It's time to thank my amazing patrons of the month. This month we have Lennox, Amanda, Baruch, Irene, Jenny, Kim, Lisa, Sabby Panda, Sam, Sarah, Savvy, and Scribbling Cat. And Baruch, whose name I hope I am pronouncing correctly, if I'm not, they can feel free to correct me, is a newcomer to our family of patrons, and that means they get a special shout out with any links that they care to share. So the first link that you're going to see from them is a webcomic that they seem to be making called Cats of the Elements. It looks very cute. They also appear to have two YouTube channels. The one, 12 Paws, looks like it has some adorable doggies involved so definitely go check that out and the other one one gamer one not so much uh, is a, seems to be a small up-and-coming gaming channel about one person who is a gamer and the other person who is not a gamer playing video games at least that's what it looks like to me so definitely check out all those links to see what they are up to and thank you so much for supporting me Biruk. and I hope all my patrons continue to support me because they are the very best like no one ever was <laughs>